What is the creepiest unsolved crime you have ever heard of? I dated a guy a while back whose father was a retired cop, who had worked the Waterdown area near Burlington, Ontario. From what I remember, there were several break-ins over the course of a few months, that all occurred in the middle of the night while the residents were home. Nothing was ever stolen, no one was ever harmed, and there were no signs of forced entry. The intruder would just stand beside the bed, sprinkle some baby powder over his feet to leave an outline, just to let them know he had been three feet away watching them as they slept. They never caught the guy. The Yogurt Shop Murders Firefighters are called to a blazing yogurt shop, after extinguishing the fire they find the bodies of four teenage girls bound and assaulted. Two men were nearly convicted but were released as advances in DNA revealed the presence of third man. The prosecution of the case has been paused until it's determined the identity and role of the third man. Disappearance of Amy Lynn Bradley Basically, a girl goes missing during a cruise with her family in 1998. A year later, a guy reported being approached by her at a brothel. She told him her name is Amy Bradley and asked him to help her. Before he could do anything, she was escorted upstairs. That guy ended up reporting this to the police, several months later. By the time he reported it, the brothel had been burned down. Moore Murray disappeared the evening of February 9, 2004 after crashing her car on Route 112 in Haverhill, New Hampshire. She was in college, emailed professor she had to go home due to a family emergency, false, packed her bags and left. She withdrew $280 from an ATM. She then bought $40 worth of alcohol. She got into a car accident at approx 7.30. Someone pulled over and offered to call the police. She refused and asked them not to. The witness drove home and called the police. By the time they arrived she was gone, and all her belongings were left in the car except her debit card, credit card, and cell phone none of which have ever been used or found. Not to forget those creepy videos that were found on YouTube which seemed to reference this event. It was posted on the 8th anniversary of her disappearance. Also, the guy who originally posted it had the username Mr112Dirtbag. 112 was the number of the street she disappeared on, and in a later interview, Mora's father said that she might have been kidnapped by some dirtbags. Lastly, Mr. 112 Dirtbag had posted some other videos, one of which was simply called Mora Murray. It was some random video showing a ticket to a ski resort close to where she disappeared. I live in San Antonio, Texas. There's a story about a maid walking into a room and seeing this man wrapping up sheets soaked with blood. She started screaming. He took off. The cops showed up and found blood all over the bed and in the tub. They followed the trail of blood outside but it was raining so they lost it. They found out he was at another hotel. He killed himself right before they opened the door. Well they never found out who he killed. He had been seen bringing woman over to his room. The city had a lot of construction going on in the 60s so they think he threw the bag in some cement. There was an episode of America's Most Wanted that focused on unsolved kidnappings. One was about a girl who was kidnapped and was found dead. And every year, supposedly on the day she was murdered or her birthday, the kidnapper calls the mom. He doesn't say anything. She talks. Then he laughs and plays her daughter's favorite song with you all the way by New Edition and hangs up. The lady who was found in the water supply tank on the roof of a hotel in Los Angeles people were bathing in and drinking that water for weeks. They found her when people complained of foul-tasting water and black water coming out of the shower. The coroner ruled it an accidental death by drowning, but it's a really weird story. The tanks were on the roof, gated, locked, had an alarm system, and they found her in the tank with the lid secured. They had to cut the tank open to remove the body. The Ketty Murders. It took place in 1981. A 36-year-old woman and her five kids were staying in a cabin outside of Quincy, California, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. On the night of the crime, the oldest daughter stayed the night at a friend's cabin. When she returned in the morning, she found her mother, 15-year-old brother, and his 17-year-old friend completely massacred, and her 12-year-old sister missing. The victims had all been bludgeoned with a hammer, tied up, stabbed, strangled. Blood was splattered everywhere. Furniture was smashed into pieces. Walls were pounded on. A steak knife had been used so forcefully that it was bent 25 degrees. Whoever committed the crime had gone on an absolute rampage, and was apparently there for about 10 hours. Curiously, the mom's two youngest sons and their friend who was staying the night were found unharmed in an upstairs bedroom. 
Only one of them claimed to have heard slash seen anything, but he was so young that his statement was pretty useless to the police. The unharmed friend was the prime suspect's son, although that guy was eventually released by the cops due to a lack of evidence. The murders were never solved. Three years later, part of the missing 12-year-old girl's skull was found about 50 miles away. She had been decapitated. In May of 1990 in my hometown, Cape Coral, Florida, a 11-year-old girl named Robin Cornell and her mother's roommate, 31-year-old Lisa Story, were found suffocated and assaulted in the early morning hours by Robin's mother, who had been out for the evening. One of the most chilling details of the case are what Jan, Robin's mother, found when she first set foot in her home that morning. Both Robin and Lisa knew not to lock the front door's doorknob because it was broken they were to use only the deadbolt. But when Jan returned home around 4 a.m. that early morning, she found both locks locked. She thought she heard footsteps coming down the stairs of the townhome so she went around to the sliding glass door on the side patio to try to get in that way. She found the blinds swaying in the breeze. Even eerier, when she stepped into the house, pictures of Robin and her older sister were arranged on an ironing board. And from there she knew something was wrong. My family knew the Cornells, they had lived in the same apartment complex for several years, and so this case has always stood out to me. I was a few months away from being born when it happened so I never knew Robin, but my cousins played with her as kids. The police have never found the person who did this. A woman believed to be from the Pacific Northwest stole a birth certificate and started a new life but there is absolutely zero account or evidence of her before 1988. She actually married and had a baby before killing herself post-divorce in 2010, which was when her ex-husband found the birth certificate and name changed Oxbury in her closet. The only theory I've seen that's remotely plausible was that she's an escapee from Enfield's community. It could explain that she never did have her own birth certificate, and more than one person's pointed out a similarity between her and Enfield's Prophet's family that got into some serious trouble in the 80s. The McStay family disappearance slash murder. A family of four with two boys ages four and five. One day they just disappeared from their home, left eggs out on the counter, bowls of popcorn for the kids left on the couch, their dogs left outside, the doors all locked with no sign of forced entry. Their car was found later in a mall parking lot full of newly purchased toys, the kids' car seats strapped in and the driver and passenger seats left in a position appropriate for the parents' sizes. No one had any clue where they went or why. Three years later their skeletal remains are found in two shallow graves 170 meters from where the car was found. The Sodder Children. On December 24, 1945 Jeannie Sodder, mother of nine children went to bed in their family home in West Virginia. Some of them were allowed to stay up while she did so, and she fell asleep. She was woken at midnight by a phone call, and a woman's voice asked if someone Jeannie didn't recognize was there. Then it laughed and hung up. She also reported hearing noises on the roof. After having fallen asleep again, she woke up in the early hours of the morning to the smell of smoke, finding the house on fire. She and her husband managed to rescue four of the children, but when looking for their ladder, the husband found it missing, and none of the family's trucks were working to go and get help with. Five children went missing, and though apparently bones and organs were found in the ashes of the house, they were redeemed by a coroner on belonging to an animal. Then Mrs. Sodder received a letter postmarked from Kentucky in 1968 that contained a picture of a young man with Louis Sodder. I love brother Frankie. A90132 or 35 written onto the back. The family still believes their children were kidnapped. In 2003, a middle-aged pizza delivery guy walks into and robs a bank with a strange bulky collar around his neck. Fifteen minutes later he's stopped by police in a parking lot. He tells them that he was kidnapped, had a bomb collar fitted around his neck, and was told he had to rob a bank and give the money to his attackers or they would detonate the bomb. Sitting handcuffed in the parking lot, he's shouting at the police, take this thing off me. Why won't you take this off me? The police keep their distance and call the bomb squad. Three minutes before the bomb squad arrives, the collar starts emitting an accelerating beeping noise. Moments later it goes off, blowing a hole in the man. 46-year-old Brian Wells died moments later. Despite 10-plus years of leads and mysterious evidence, the crime was never solved. Thanks for tuning in to Reddit Streams. Hit the subscribe button and the notification bell for more videos. Share your views in the comments below.